The Ermac Centre is proud to present the SFU Fellows of the Royal Society of Canada Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the fall 2012 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of History, Chemistry, the Centre for Dialogue, and the Beattie School of Business. Today's speaker is Dr. Mario Pinto from the Department of Chemistry. Most of you will know Mario was born in Sri Lanka. He obtained BSc degrees and PhD degree from Queen's University. He was a NATO Science Fellow in France and did some work at NRC in Ottawa. He joined Simon Fraser University in 1983 and was Chair of the Department of Chemistry. And, and since 2004, he's been Vice President of Research. He's very prolific in the scientific community. He's been initiated several centers and collaborations. He's served on most of the major scientific funding bodies related to his research and in medical research. And not just sitting on grants adjudication and national awards, but also in setting policy. Uh, very active in the Canadian Society for Chemistry ever since from day one and this culminated in 2010 in, in him being president of that society and representing Canada uh, in the areas of chemical education activities in various international functions. I think what sets Mario apart is his, uh, his willing and his passion for mentorship, not just at the, at the young person level, but also from all the way up to faculty and young faculty, new starting faculty, and some of us who are not so young anymore. He's uh, been very involved, uh, particularly with high schools, and he's mentored students who have gone on to win national awards in Canadian science fairs. His students have gone on to won great acclaim and awards such as the NSERC Thesis Doctoral Prize, which is very prestigious. Um, with all that, though, it doesn't uh, get you entrance into the Royal Society of Canada for that. And in this instance, this was based on his scholarly research. Uh, most of you will know his research spans confirmation and analysis, molecular modeling, NMR, mimicry, uh, mimicry of the biological kind, that is, protein ligand interactions. And it's no exaggeration to say that he is uh, a leading uh, Canada's, one of Canada's leading uh, researchers in bioorganic chemistry and he's an international leader in certain areas of that in synthesis and confirmation analysis and mass spectroscopy. This has been recognized uh, by many, many bodies. It, within the CSC, he's won the uh, Robert Lemieux Award, the Bernard Below Award, the Merck Frost Therape Therapeutic Research Award, and outside that in the BCIC he's won the uh, New Frontiers Research Award and in the American Chemical Society the Horace S. Isbell Award. And so uh, as you can see he's a very wide and larger than life character and he's very fitting to have been entered into the Royal Society of Canada and he was admitted to that in 2003. So please uh, join me in welcome Mario to give his talk today. <laughs> I'll use the other mic. Thank you, Steve. Uh, in my remaining 10 minutes, <laughs> I'll try to tell you a little bit. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. It's a pleasure uh, to see all of you here, and let me tell you a little bit about what we do. I dedicate this lecture to Blair Johnston, uh, my good friend and longtime research associate who died recently from pancreatic cancer. So this is for Blair. I'm a chemical glycobiologist. I'm sorry, but that's what I do. Okay? So and let me tell you a little bit about what that means. Uh, glyco means carbohydrate, and on your cells, you have glyco. These are the red and white items attached to other molecules. These turn out to be lipids, so that's a glycolipid, or attached to proteins, that's a glycoprotein usually resulting in an enzyme. Okay. 
These serve as attachment points for the entry of viruses, the entry of toxins, such as the O157 E. coli toxin uh, that is causing problems at the moment. Uh, they serve as points of attachment for bacteria entering your cells. They serve as a recognition markers for antibodies, and that dictates your cell type. So if you're blood type A, you have a certain type of glyco or carbohydrate. If you're type B, you have another. Okay? Interactions between cells are also mediated by carbohydrates. For example, in embryonic development, in fertilization, and in metastatic cancer. And so glycostructures play a very important role in biological systems. We're also interested in looking at events within the cell. And so when proteins are synthesized in the nucleus, they are transported through a series of structures here called the ER and the Golgi before they can be secreted from your cells in these granules. Sometimes things go wrong. And there are aberrant events in that trafficking process. And chemists, glycochemists, can alter that trafficking process in the construction of glycoproteins and glycolipids. I draw your attention to one compartment here, an organelle called the lysosome. This is the garburator of the cell, which cuts down and destroys many of the unused bits using a variety of enzymes. So enzymes are proteins that catalyze different types of activities. And within that lysosome, there are a series of enzymes that break down a variety of compounds and even pieces of organelles. Let me illustrate the point using Pompe disease. This is a lysosomal storage disease. And it was made famous by this recent film, Extraordinary Measures, featuring Harrison Ford as a very crusty glycobiologist. But this, the plot line is shown here. John Crowley starts a biotech company because his kids uh, were dying of Pompe disease. He raises millions of dollars by VC investment. He resigns from his company so that there's no conflict of interest, so that his own kids can then participate in the clinical trial. A biotech company comes along, that's Genzyme, buys up Crowley's original company, and goes to work uh, developing the drug Mysozyme, which is used today for the treatment of Pompe disease. Okay? Crowley's skills are alive, but they have significant symptoms from Pompe disease because they were started very late on Mysozyme. So the story is uh, leading to a very obvious conclusion. One has to start very early, early diagnosis in infants in order to be able to identify subpopulations before treating them. Okay? We contributed to this story by helping Mike Gelb at the University of Washington by developing that diagnostic test for Pompe disease and four other related lysosomal storage diseases. Okay. So we decided to take the high road. We went into public domain. We did not publish. We did not patent, pardon me, uh, because this was for kids. And we made a deal with Genzyme then that they would not exploit uh, this technology. We gained some notoriety in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, but it was fairly low key and our fame was uh, fairly localized. However, the reason I show you this uh, clip at the beginning and this commercial is to make two points. Right? The first is that one cannot underestimate the power of celebrities. Since the appearance of the movie, the awareness of these lysosomal storage diseases has increased markedly, much more than we were able to do. Five states in the US have now made the newborn screening technique that we pioneered mandatory, and they've legalized that. So importance of uh, celebrities uh, cannot be underestimated. Genzyme was acquired by Sanofi Aventis, La Big Pharma, and they ma now make the kit available free of charge. So it costs $2 per disease, $10 per patient to do the proper testing and then to proceed with uh, 
with treatment. Of course, they make their money by selling, selling the enzyme. So it's not all altruistic. So let me get to, actually, the second reason I told you that story is to show you that chemical glycobiologists can sometimes make a contribution to uh, quality of life. My wife, if she were in the audience, would disagree and challenge that statement, but uh, <laughs> she's not here, fortunately. So let me get back to the main topic uh, of the talk. I've chosen two vignettes, which uh, Charles has told me what they are now, so I'm very, they're, they're very small stories, right? Uh, because I had to go through my lab and figure out uh, uh, what I would present uh, in an intelligent fashion. So I've chosen two, and we work on several, but I've chosen two uh, that have some impact on human health. Tuberculosis is a huge problem. Recognized by the WHO, uh, one third of the world's population is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. You all have been immunized, most likely, but immunization is only 80% effective in North America and it's not at all effective in India, not at all effective in Sri Lanka. The closer you go to the equator, the less effective the vaccine. You're, you're vaccinated with BCG, which is an attenuated form of the bovine strain. So not working too well, uh, 3 million deaths per year attributed to TB. And what's more alarming is the emergence of these drug-resistant strains. Right? Uh, resistant to a lot of the antibiotic. So the WHO has declared TB a global health emergency, and justifiably so. So when we looked at this problem, we asked ourselves, how can we make a contribution? And we looked at this mycobacterium and the cell wall of that mycobacterium, and we've taken a bit of that cell wall and enlarged it here. And you see a variety of structures. These are all molecular structures. Every stick connects different atoms. Okay? And so you have a variety of structures, and I'll come back to these in greater detail later, but you have peptidoglycan layers. You have polymers of galactose, polymers of arabinose, all kinds of different structures. These are lipids called mycolic acids. Okay? A very complicated structure. And so we decided our approach would be to interfere with assembly of that structure. Right? And that would be our therapeutic intervention. Before I go there, let me introduce you to some of our tools. And the tools are very important. One of our favorite tools is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is a beautiful baby. This is a 900 megahertz instrument, 21 Tesla superconducting magnet. And this has been my... Uh, uh, love for all my life ever since I was a grad student. I was the only graduate student uh, allowed to run the first and only uh, superconducting NMR spectrometer in the country in the 70s, uh, in the last century. But we've come a long way since then. The, this is a 21 Tesla instrument. Uh, I was one of nine who got funding for the first 19 Tesla instrument. And that's placed in Edmonton. And we just put in a 20 Tesla instrument uh, at UBC, which we share. Okay. We have two baby machines. Uh, there are 14 Tesla instruments, which serve us well uh, for most uh, purposes. But when we need to, uh, we go to the larger superconducting magnets. What those instruments do is the following. They give us what we call a spectrum, a series of lines, right? which we assign to particular atoms in a molecule. So the sticks are bonds, the spheres are atoms which are connected by the bonds. Okay? And this spectrum then identifies these different atoms. And from that <coughs> definition, we can then determine a structure of a molecule. But in my case, I'm much more interested in determining the conformation or the shape of the molecule. And so the next slide will show what we do in two dimensions and how there are psychologists in the audience. What do you see? <laughs> I, I see beauty in this because these little splotches tell me what atoms are close to one another in space. 
So I can tell you that that atom is close to that one, and that atom is close to that. And you can imagine then that if you have a sufficient number of those contacts, you can then specify the three-dimensional shape of a molecule, as shown here. This is even better because we're doing it in the, this experiment in the presence of an enzyme, a protein, and assisted with computer modeling, we can also tell you what groups in the enzyme are contacting that particular molecule. That's useful information because this is a drug candidate. And if I want to optimize that drug candidate, I have to know how it interacts in real time with its receptor, whether it's a drug receptor, an enzyme, or an antibody. So let me introduce you to another technique. Based on our initial work, uh, Bent Meyer, my friend in Germany, realized that he could do this experiment in the opposite sense. He chose an unfortunate acronym for this technique, uh, STD NMR, but the, it works in the following way. One irradiates with radio frequency the protein. Okay? And one allows transfer of information or magnetization by spin diffusion through that structure. Now, this is an equilibrium. This is a small molecule drug candidate. It binds to its complementary receptor. If it binds in a way where these red bits are close to the receptor, magnetization will be transferred from the protein to these atoms which are close in space to the receptor. The black atoms will not be affected. Now suppose this molecule leaves the receptor, and that's defined by an off rate, K off, and that is very fast relative to the time it takes to relax back to its ground state equilibrium. We can use this as a memory sensor. So this molecule leaves taking with it the information it had here. And in the same way then, can specify what we call the bioactive confirmation. And this has become one of our main tools, and we're one of the five uh, uh, leading groups uh, internationally in this area. So out of this then, we get the red bits, which contact the protein very closely. We get the orange bits that contact the protein less so, and the yellow bits, which contacted very little. And that allows us to map topography. Okay. But that's not enough. If you throw your cat up in the air, right, it usually lands very gracefully. And before it does that, it goes through all these contortions, these different conformations. And this is a dynamic event. As the cat starts off there and goes through all these dynamic motions to land on its feet. So we have to do more. Molecules do the same. They're not static. They're twisting, they're turning. And so this is one particular molecule, and this is from a Monte Carlo simulation, where we observe atoms in a molecule shifting in space right, as a function of time. One, we also use molecular dynamics, and you will hear me refer in the talk to molecular dynamics, or MD, uh, and I won't show any Monte Carlo simulations, but assisted with those computational methods, we can then make a start at understanding these different structures. So this is the cell wall structure of M tuberculosis again. I've put structures now to, to the color codes, and we're going to concentrate on this yellow layer, which is a polymer of an unusual sugar, galactofurinose. Well, why, why is that important? It's important for the following reason. Galactofurinose is absent in all mammalian systems. And so if you can inhibit construction of that layer, you can inhibit assembly of the tuberculosis cell wall, and you can do so without interfering with humans. So to put structure to this, this is galactofurinose, no big deal. It just means that there's a five-membered ring here, and humans, or mammals, have galactopyrinose. That means you have a six-membered ring here. There's an enzyme 
which is we call UDP GALP mutase. All enzymes end with A's. And that converts this structure to that structure. So it takes a six-membered ring, converts it to a five-membered ring. We'll call this UDP gal P for pyranose, and that UDP gal F. UDP is this portion. This is gal F, that's gal P. Okay? You could call it Fred and Ethel, if you wish. That's one of the enzymes. The other enzyme is a transferase that has to build up this polymer of five-membered galactofrenose moieties. So you've generated this, and now you have to start stringing it together like beads on a necklace. And you do that with another enzyme, and that's a GAL-F transferase. Okay? So GAL -F, UDP GAL-F is then polymerized, and the trick here is there are two types of linkages. One is attachment at that position, and one is attachment at that position. They may all look the same to you, but trust me that you get an alternating polymer. And so the question, in order to understand this particular enzyme is, well, it's bifunctional. It catalyzed formation of two types of linkages. How does that happen? And I'll come back to that. Let me get back to the first enzyme. Don't worry about this, but just for the aficionados in the audience, I just want to point out that this moiety, which comes from a flavin coenzyme, is very important. This is an isoaloxazine moiety of the FAD moiety that attacks at C1 of GALAC UDP GAL P and affects the conversion to UDP GAL F. So six membered to five member. Okay? We've gone through several of the mechanistic aspects here, but I don't want to dwell on that. I want to come back to STDNMR and show you what we can do with that technique using UDP gal P, UDP gal F, and UDP itself, which is missing this sugar moiety. So gal P is missing, gal F is missing, and we call that UDP. This is an inhibitor of the enzyme. And so we're going to look at how these interact with the enzyme in the NMR tube. First of all, let me show you something uh, uh, different about this enzyme. This is under oxidizing conditions. The enzyme is in stasis. It's inactive. As soon as we reduce it, in this case, with sodium dithionite, 12 degrees, that's all it takes, you have conversion instantly from the UDP GALF to UDP gal P. Enzymes work in both directions. Right? So supplying the enzyme then, UGM, converts UDP gal F to UDP gal P. And it, it's only functional under reducing conditions. We can do competition experiments between those two substrates for the enzyme active site. And we can follow these signals. Bottom line is always on the bottom of the slide. When it's oxidized, the binding of UDP gal P is weaker when UGM is in the oxidized state. That switches around and is stronger than UDP when UGM is in the reduced state. So this is a switch. This is a control mechanism right? that when you want activity, you reduce the enzyme and you switch affinities. So that's one switch. After a great deal of work, we found that this is the isoaloxazine moiety again of FAD. This is the moiety that's reduced or oxidized in that enzyme. It's non-covalently bound. And you see here a general trend. UDP occupies the site. It's bound tighter than the others. But as soon as you reduce it, UDP gal P or gal F binds tighter. Okay? This is another inhibitor. Okay, our molecular modeling and our dynamics I showed you earlier gives us different poses of how this particular molecule would be sitting within the enzyme active site and I show here two possibilities. This turns out to be the correct one and we can go further. So this is UDP gal F in the enzyme active site let me identify a few important 
features. This is the FAD, isoleloxazine moiety, I talked about before. This is a tryptophan. This is an amino acid, and I'll refer to this as TRYP160, also refer to it as W160, the one-letter amino acid code. This arginine is very important, and I want you to keep your eye on that arginine as we do molecular dynamics. That whole loop swings in, and it forms very important binding interactions before one can get catalytic activity. So a few features of this are very important. Right? And the question is, is, does this make sense? This image that we get from molecular dynamics, which is substantiated by the STD NMR. Well, certainly, that mechanistic slide I showed you has the nitrogen of this isooxygen moiety attacking at carbon one of the galactose moiety, and that certainly is positioned to do so. But it's not enough. Uh, we need experimental evidence, and we need experimental evidence on a faster time scale. Uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy is on a very slow time scale. And so for that, I turn to my colleague, Melanie O'Neill, who was able to follow fluorescence emission enhancement and was able to assess the dissociation contents, uh, constants and also the trip emission. And you'll see here some extraordinary things. When UGM is oxidized and reduced, you'll see the trip emission stays the same if UDP is bound. But if the substrate is bound, dramatic change in fluorescence enhancement right? upon reduction. You'll see also what I told you previously, that the dissociation constants reverse. Okay? So now this is coming off the enzyme very low rate when it's oxidized, so it's bound tighter than UDP, and that switches when you reduce. Okay? So we have consistency with the two time scales, and I'm going to summarize data to tell you that what I've told you before, the binding affinity of UDP drops tenfold upon reduction. UDP gal P binds more tightly when the enzyme is reduced. Importantly, there's no trip fluorescence on binding of UDP to UGM, and this will become important, or even the substrate to the oxidized enzyme. So what does all this mean? Well, we thought we had it. We said, well, it must be due to that TRIP160 interacting with the substrate. right? And that's got to be the key interaction with the substrate. But we were wrong. Because when we made the mutant, the double mutant, there are three tryptophans in this molecule. So you knock out the other two, right? You make that a phenylalanine, and we don't see any changes in fluorescence upon binding of the substrate to that mutant. So the changes in trip fluorescence must be due to the loop movement and not to that trip 160. Important piece of information. Back to NMR. Looking at ligand binding, right, now, the wild type, and we made another mutant. This is where we've replaced the TRIP160 for an alanine. And here you see very similar epitopes recognized by the wild type and the mutant, right? Although the binding of the ligand to the mutant was weaker. This is in the oxidized state. Okay? You've seen this before. This is the wild type. Binding of UDP gal P is weaker than UDP when it's oxidized. But now, both UDP and UDP gal P bind together with the mutant. And that's in contrast to the wild type. So what's going on here? Well, competition experiments show the following. Right? This is the wild type where we're competing UDP Gal P for UDP. We're knocking one out of the site. You see good competition for the wild type. You see good competition for the double mutant, but flatline zero competition for the TRIP 160 mutant. That means there's UDP and UDP Gal P are not competing. 
Well, we scratched our heads for a long time, but our molecular dynamics showed us po a possibility for why this is true. So let me orient you. This is the mutant where we've taken out the TRIP-160, we've replaced it with alanine. This is how the substrate sits in the site. This is the isooxazine moiety of FAD. Okay? So this is udp galf in the site. When we look at what UDP does, we identified a different binding mode up here. And we found, in fact, that both UDP and udp gal p which would sit here, could be accommodated. So this was a very wide binding site. The system does not adopt a closed conformation. That loop is swung wide open. And it does not engage the necessary interactions for catalytic activity. So OK, so that's the oxidized enzyme. We thought, OK, we, we now understand that. And then we did the experiment that sent us to the pub right away. Because uh, we reduced the enzyme. And we didn't know what was going on because we got flatline. That's the normal spectrum. This is an SDD experiment. Flatline, flatline, flatline. Okay. So no, no binding. That's what that's telling you. And it, we also found that the mutant was catalytically inactive. And no conversions observed between these two. So what's going on with this mutant? Well, we figured it out, had a little bit of wine, it all became crystal clear. And we came up with this theory, which we wrote down on napkins at Club Elia, and which we subsequently published, that the substrate directs loop dynamics by bridging the FAD site and the TRIP-160 site, and that the substrate was providing a conduit. So the important facts were the following. Changes in TRIP fluorescence are due to loop movement, to coordinate the substrate. This requires interactions between the FAD and the sugar, galactose. Since we didn't observe any trifluorescence upon binding of UDP to UGM or UDP gal P to the oxidized enzyme. So this UDP is lacking the gal, right? So it doesn't interact. Binding affinity drops by tenfold. We know that this W160 substrate interaction is essential, right? since that reduced enzyme does not bind, the mutant enzyme. And there's greater loop mobility in this mutant, and there's really no coordination of loop movement. So with that, we came up with this uh, model. This is an equilibrium of a loop open, loop closed. That's a loop. Okay. This is the FAD moiety on that protein. An equilibrium between, sorry, this is the FAD moiety. This is the TRIP-160 moiety. An equilibrium between open and closed loop. Throw in a substrate, random orientation, we don't perturb that equilibrium. But when the substrate orients in the correct way, when the sugar moiety, galactose, interacts with the isooxazine moiety of the FAD, when the TRIP-160 provides the orientation and the anchoring of the substrate. Sparks fly, one lights up the substrate. That substrate acts as the conduit, relaying information from this site, subsite, to that subsite, and leading then to catalytic activity. So there are a lot of things going on. There's loop movement, right, shifting the equilibrium this way, so that the loop close conformation is able to form the stabilizing interactions that then allow catalytic activity and turnover of gal P to gal F. Yeah. So we published this, and uh, this was our final computational model. Uh, I've switched this on its head. The TRIP-160 is now at the top of the site, isooxazine at the bottom of the site, but the orientation is as shown. This appeared meant several years before the crystal structure. This was the only model in the literature as we went ahead with design of drug candidates. And that is the crystal structure of another species, UGM, uh, obtained by our collaborator, David Sanders. And we got it right. Interactions of the 
isoloxazine moiety with the galactose moiety, and TRIP, now 184, it's a different species, with the substrate. So that's the first enzyme. What about the second enzyme? This is a transferase. We're going to extend the polymer either at the 5 position or the 6 position. Right? This has 1,5 transferase activity, 1,6 transferase activity. The question we asked was a very simple one. Do they occupy, do those transformations take place in the same site? Monica fell in love, and so she did these slides. What are you going to do? <laughs> This uh, is another STD NMR experiment, a competition experiment. Uh, and the, the logic is as follows. If substrates bind to the same active sites, we can titrate these two ligands into the enzyme. right? And if they occupy the same site, they'll compete for the same site. But there's a possibility that the substrate might bind at a different site. So three may go in here and two may go in there, right? And if that's the case, then when we look at our STD effects, they will not necessarily be affected as one titrates one substrate with the other. It's more complicated because you could have what is called an allosteric site and a non-competitive effect where binding at the other site then affects binding at the original site. And so we have to sort out these two possibilities. Is it competitive or non-competitive binding? And we can do that. And we do that in the following way. If it's non-competitive, right, then this three binds in the bottom site, two binds in the top site. The STD for two would not appear. STD for three would not decrease. Right? If it is, in fact, competitive, we would have these compensating effects. And if you look at the graphs, if you look at the red curves, they increase. But concomitantly, the blue curves decrease. So the STD effects for one ligand are increasing. STD effects for the other ligand are decreasing. That tells us that they're competing at the same site. And we do it in the opposite sense, right? where we now start with three in the site. We put in small amounts of two. And again, you get compensating curves. So they do bind competitively at the same site. And they're processed at the same site. So the bottom line here is they bind competitively. There is a caveat. If there's no mutual allosteric effect, uh, we assume that there's no mutual allosteric effect of the binding of 2 and 3. So 2 and 3 are processed at the same site. And this has led Todd Lowry to develop a model for elaboration of that polysaccharide. And importantly, the enzyme is alive in the NMR tube because we generate tetrasaccharide products. OK, nature, in the same way that this lava mimics this tree branch, has come up with a very elaborate system of molecular mimicry. And so these compounds, oh, what happened to my aminothiazole? Uh, it's not nice to trick nature, mother nature, you know. These, this compound doesn't resemble the substrates I showed you at all. Right? Yet I'm going to show you that they inhibit UGM, the enzyme. And this aminothiazole inhibits UGM. So does the pyrazole. This is now from the UGM of tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis. But there are several strains of tuberculosis. So you see that they have very different activities depending on whether you're testing against BCG, the blue curve, or smegmatis, which everyone uses in the lab, or tuberculosis. And you see that the aminothiazole is, in fact, not active against M. tuberculosis. Okay? The pyrazole is. Ethambutol does a fantastic job. Regarding toxicity towards THP monocyte cells, you see that ethambutol is very good. It's not very toxic. This is the lethal dose for 50% killing. Pyrazole uh, is uh, worse than ethambutol, but the aminothiazole is really quite toxic to cells. Okay? These are the minimum inhibitory concentrations. And you see, again, aminothiazole is very high. Uh, these are not too bad. And BCG uh, shows these figures. Right? But it's important, the take home lesson here, is it's important to study the real strains. 
The problem with TB is that it resides in your macrophages and it won't let go. And so we have to do studies inside macrophages. Right? And so that's what we do here. And I show you here that ethambutol still works. Right? That's the pyrazole compound. That's the aminothiazole compound. But remember, I also told you that this aminothiazole compound is very toxic to cells. It's even worse because these mycobacteria go into hibernation mode and what we call a non-replicating phase, and then they're very difficult to treat. So since I told you that we're interfering with cell wall biosynthesis, you wouldn't expect them to work. And sure enough, the pyrazole compound doesn't work. Ethambutol also interferes with cell wall biosynthesis. It doesn't work in this non-replicating phase. The aminothiazole compound appears to work, but it's because it's killing the cells. Okay? So it's important to do all these controls. We have some new candidates that we're looking at at the moment, but I won't tell you about that. Doing the work on UGM dynamics, uh, Dustin Blair, on NMR of UGM, Yue Yuan, on NMR of the GALF transferase, Monica Chapina, Wes Zandberg doing the in vitro enzymatic assays, and Sylvia Borelli doing the uh, cell-based assays. And I'm very grateful to Ensuk for uh, this portion of the work. Now, uh, the beauty about this work is you're able to interact with young, bright colleagues. David Sanders at the University of Saskatchewan, Todd Lowry at the uh, University of Alberta. David provides us with the UGM enzymes, Todd, the GALF transferase enzymes, and some of the substrates. And the late, great Melanie O'Neill, uh, my collaborator on the fluorescence work, uh, and I miss her dearly. She used to say that I had the attention span of a hummingbird. And it's absolutely true, so I'm going to flip to the next topic uh, and talk about carbohydrates in health and disease right? and the process of digestion. Now, when we were cavemen, I was there, <laughs> you know, hunters and gatherers, we burned energy, right? And so eating large volumes of grains and carbohydrates didn't matter because there was an energy equation. I'm convinced that cavemen were never obese. They didn't develop type 2 diabetes, probably because they died early, but, uh, but th they certainly were not obese. They didn't have metabolic syndrome. We do now. Kids today, 11-year-olds in India, in China, there's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes and obesity. There's something wrong. It's very simple. The energy equation is out of balance. Right? What goes in has to be consumed. There are further diseases, for example, associated with carbohydrate malabsorption. One is called CSID, congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, where these kids don't have these enzymes to break down starch. So I'm going to go very quickly here, but let me tell you that this would have been impossible uh, in terms of a solo event. We started work with uh, cell extracts from intestinal cells, from cell walls of intestines, and I realized very quickly that we weren't going to make headway unless we brought in the right partners. And so we brought together in the Starch Digestion Consortium these beautiful people. We leave our egos at the door and we work together. Burford Nichols, clinical pediatrician at Baylor College of Medicine. Hassan Nahim, cell biologist in Hanover. Roberto in Mexico, a molecular biologist. Bruce Hamacher, structural chemist of starch. I'm the chemical biologist. David Rose of Waterloo is the structural biologist. We call ourselves the Starchies, and we're looking for a theme song. Yeah. We work very well together it's to look at how one degrades starch. This is the most complex molecule that I've ever encountered. It appears to be simple. If you dissect and go in and look at these structures, it's a linear polymer of glucose shown with the green bonds. And that specifies a particular linkage between the one atom of that glucose unit and the four atom of this glucose unit. There's another structure where you have these branches at the six atom of this glucose unit. And that leads to amylopectin. These are huge molecules. One breaks those down in the following way. You have salivary alpha amylase in your mouth then go on to process with pancreatic alpha amylase. 
then you, you go into the small intestine, and there are two key enzymes, maltase glucoamylase, sucrase isomaltase, with different domains, and I'll come back to that, that breaks down the polymer into glucose, and then that's transported across the intestinal wall. Now, let me go back. Gut health is one of the most important items. That's why there's this flurry of activity uh, with prebiotics and probiotics. Because everyone has realized that gut health is important. If you don't process properly here, you have a starch load going into the colon, you have colonic fermentation by bacteria, and you lead to fatty acid biosynthesis, implications for obesity. This bowel function has also been linked to irritable bowel syndrome in the adult and to Crohn's disease. So important implications of having this machinery working well for you, right? In the olden days, examination of stools was considered to be a, a diagnostic of disease states. And this was practiced by most doctors. And if you watch the movie, The Madness of King George, you would have seen it there. As a matter of fact, Nabil tells me that, comment allez-vous, how, how are you going, comes from exactly that, that uh, scenario where one wants to know how you are going. Of course, the Brits had to be more sophisticated, and they changed that to, how do you do? Right? Yeah. And in, in the modern vernacular, of course, it's, uh, how are you doing? How is it going? But next time you say that, think about it. <laughs> okay. So let me go into some detail. We have mapped these enzymes, and that's our contribution to science. Uh, the starches have done this. We can tell you now which each, what each of these domains does, what's fast, what's slow, in terms of kinetic activity, and what the specificities are. Okay? So I'm not going to go through all these. Let me just uh, zoom through some slides, and I'll apologize. But we're cleaving this linkage, and I'll introduce my terminology, MGAM is maltase glucoamylase, SI is sucrase isomaltase. Okay. In cartoon form, just keep this in your head, this is what's happening. <coughs> your intestinal wall is studded with enterocytes. On those enterocytes, you have microvilli. That's an expansion of a microvillus with these enzymes. These are called glucosidases. So that would be maltase glucoamylase or sucrase isomaltase. They're processing these polymers of glucose to release glucose, which are then absorbed through the bloodstream. Okay. These come from ancestral gene duplication, 60% sequence similarity or identity between the N-terminal domains or the C-terminal domains, but only 40% between the N and the C-terminal domains. So what are we trying to do here? What we figured out is that you have to delay the digestion of ingested carbohydrates. Okay? That is going to reduce stress on the beta cells of the pancreas. You're going to reduce the incidence of insulin resistance. And you're going to have, if you can inhibit this degradation, you'll have less free glucose release. But you want to control it. You don't want to eliminate it because you need glucose. Okay? So the key is to figure out how you can control this process. So when we began this project, we asked certain questions. <coughs> the first, why is there a redundancy? Why all these enzymes to do the same thing? Could we regulate the individual activities with certain inhibitors, leaving the remaining one or more subunits active? We call this toggling. And why do we want to do that? <coughs> We want to place the onus of digestion on the slower acting enzymes. That way we can delay glucose release. You have 10 feet of small intestine. And we don't want this spike all right, in the first three inches. We want it further down. And that has other implications as well. <coughs> and of course, if we can moderate the glucose release, we could control type 2 diabetes and other metabolic diseases. Echobos is marketed by Bayer for the treatment of diabetes. 
I went back to my roots in Sri Lanka. That's my grandfather, who suffered from type 2 diabetes. And he had one of these mugs. And uh, in Sri Lanka, they fill this mug, carved out of the roots of Selassia, and drink it as a treatment for type 2 diabetes. That's me. I was cute once, but not anymore. <laughs> there are certain unusual structures that have come out of this plan. Yoshikawa uh, was the one who isolated several of them, but we synthesized many of them before isolation, and we, in fact, provided proof of structure. Very unusual molecules, sulfonium ions with internal sulfate counterions. Zwitterionic uh, substances, uh, selacinol was the original, cotalinol comes from uh, the Sinhalese name for the plant, cotalaimbutu. So, do our compounds work? These are synthetic compounds. These are controlling glucose levels in rats. Right? This is the control group. Selacinol certainly works. That's the Bayer compound. And this is Blintol, named after Blair and Pinto. And that works as well. That's one of our synthetic analogs. In chronic studies, it also works with diabetic fatty rats. And human clinical trials done by Jaya Wardena show <coughs> that the extract also works. We were able to map the optimal motif. Now, these may all look alike to you. But you have chains of different length, and you have different stereochemistries at the different carbons. Those are all very important, because okay? some compounds are active, some are not active. These are the important features. We know what the configurations are. Let me take you through one story, how we deduce the structure of cotalinol. <laughs> so there are six undefined stereogenic centers, 64 possibilities. Well, we didn't want to make all of them, so we used our structure activity relationships with our lower homologs and one enzyme to break that down to four possible stereostructures. <coughs> and we use that as our test enzyme. What about those two? Well, we synthesized those, and they were not cotalinol. And so th these were the two left. Very simple organic chemistry, it appears, but not so simple. Those of you who have had first-year organic know that you have a nucleophile, an electrophile. Attack, opening off that cyclic sulfate, gives this molecule. <coughs> we use a very unusual solvent, more polar than water, to solvate the charges developing in the transition state. And that makes that reaction favorable. Complication, when we try to take off this protecting group, we also removed the internal sulfate. So we thought it was bad news, but there was a natural product that had been isolated from the plant, and it turned out to be the desulfonated cotalinol. This is our spectrum, and that's the spectrum of the natural compound, and you see that, that we have, in fact, desulfonated cotalinol. So we knew the structure was that, and we were bloody-minded. We were going to synthesize that. So we started from Pusitol, which we get from natu another natural source, avocados. All right? And working through that, then, we get the real cotalinol. We were in a big race for this. I didn't realize how much of a race <clears throat> until our Japanese competitors invited me and Linda, first class, to Japan. 